what I want to talk to you now to end our day is what does this all mean for St. Pius? Um, about four and a half years ago, uh, we bumped into a book called Forming Intentional Disciples, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And, and so what does it mean to be a disciple? And, um, and this is a little commercial as well. Kristen's talked about that all day long, but I think that these two sentences like really nailed me last week. Um, so Donna has been trying to get me to read this book, I think, for about four and a half years. Um, in fact, she told me not to tell Matt, but I think she's given me 16 copies of it. Um, and finally, <laughs> that's like my budget. <laughs> um, finally, I, I decided last week in Florida that I would start reading it. Um, and I'm a slow reader. I'm only like 21 pages in. And I'm 21 pages in because when I texted her and told her how great the book was, she was like, wait until page 21. And I got there and then stopped. <laughs> I'm not done yet, though. So the commercial is on October 4th at our next encounter night, we're going to begin to unpack this book. And the book is The Five Promises of Baptism. And so for the rest of this academic year, at each one of our encounter nights, we're going to talk about the implications of baptism. Because as Kristen said, that's where we started. That was where we first were introduced to God. And this, these two sentences, for me, just nailed me. It says, so there is no longer, and it's talking about, you know, how we make decisions and how we live our life and um, and, and who we are, and, and, and how are we a disciple? It says, so there is no longer any distinction between our, quote, religion and anything else we engage in. And I don't like the sentence because they use the word engage, but it helps. If something means nothing in the context of my life in Christ, then it means nothing, period. Think about that for a moment. How do you make your decisions? Think about the decisions that you make in a day. Are you asking the Lord what you should be deciding? Because every decision that you and I make is an invitation to love him more. And it's an invitation to be closer to him. It's an invitation to be with him. Every, every single decision that we make. And so if it means nothing to my life with Christ, then it means nothing, period. And I sat there after I read that sentence. It's underlined and highlighted in the book because I was like, whoa, I don't know if I do that well. So backing up, about four and a half years ago, we bumped into this book, Forming Intentional Disciples. The buzzword in the church for a while had been discipleship. We have to be disciples. And I would ask the question, like, what does that mean? I mean, I know it means to be a follower of Jesus. I know that it means to be a student, a learner. But what does it mean? And what does it mean specifically for a parish? Because I've spent my entire adult life working for a church parish. Um, so what does this mean? And so I'm at Life Team Convention in Arizona, and there's this book, Forming Intentional Disciples. And I was like, Intentional Disciples? Hmm, that's an interesting concept. What does that mean? So I picked up the book. Um, we were staying with a friend of mine after the conference, and so we went back to his house. He was at work. His wife was at school. And um, I sat there, and I geeked out on this book. And I, I think I read it cover to cover in about two hours. Um, and I geeked out because the first two chapters of the book were all, some, all statistics. So if you buy the book and you're not a statistic person, um, you can browse through like the first chapter and a half probably because you're going to get hung up on it. I've handed the book to people that are like, man, I don't really care about all these statistics. But they meant a lot to me because, as I said, I've spent my entire adult life working for the church. And I want to share some of those statistics with you. Sherry says, the fastest growing religious demographic in our country today is nuns. Not N-U-N-S. Not the ones that wear habits and go around, right? Praying for people. But nuns. N-O-N-E-S. Non-affiliated people. The fastest growing religious demographic is nuns. That one in six Americans identify as a, quote, nun. But then she made a distinguish. A, a distinguish. That. Yes. Thanks. Did I tell y'all I'm from Opelousas? And if you're from Opelousas, you're not offended. You get it. She said that being a nun doesn't necessarily equal non-belief. Because some of them do believe. 94% of them believe in God. 
49% of them believe in a personal God, 30% of them are formal members of some religious community or congregation, um, that 11% of them attend some weekly religious service. And then she said, only 30% of Americans raised Catholic are still practicing today. Only 30% of Americans raised Catholic are still practicing today. She makes the point in her book that God doesn't have grandchildren, right? He has children. But how many of us, and if I'm being honest, am still Catholic because my grandmother wanted me to be Catholic, right? How many of us, I mean, you could interview the 86 confirmation candidates that we're going to bring in to, tomorrow night, and we're going to start with them. And I guarantee you that in the course of this fall semester, as we interview them, and I ask them, why do you want to receive the sacrament of confirmation? The majority of them are going to say, because mama wants me to, right? But God doesn't have grandchildren. And so eventually, if that is the only reason that they're in the church, because mama wants me to, they're going to leave the church. And we've operated under the premise that it's okay because when they start having children, they're going to come back to get their children baptized. Guess what? That's not happening. In fact, the conversation has shifted in the church right now. There's a group of people that are now having a conversation about how do we do far away mission work? In other words, we've been sending people to foreign countries for years to proclaim Jesus to places that have never heard about him. How do we do that across the street from our church? Because that's where we're moving. That's what's, that's, that, that is the norm today. About, I don't know, almost a year ago or within the past year, this this, the Borna Institute released this study, and they identified Lafayette, Louisiana as the most Catholic area in the country that based off of their survey that they had done, that 50% of our population here in the city of Lafayette identified themselves as Catholic. Now, Kristen just went through what that could possibly mean, right? They're, they're practicing Catholics. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're coming to Mass every Sunday. But that 50% of our city identified themselves as Catholic. I, I was at a meeting right after this was um, published, and in my social media um, feeds, like this went viral because I follow a lot of people in this area that work for the church. And I mean, they boasted, like, how great are we? Because 50%, like, we're the most Catholic area in the, in the country. And I'm at this diocesan meeting, and, and a priest gets up and he says, We have the most Catholics in Lafayette, in all of the country. I was like, mm, I don't think that that's what that meant. I don't think we have the most Catholics. What it meant was that per capita, we have the most Catholics, right? I'm pretty sure that St. Anthony of Padua in, 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 in the woodlands in Houston, Texas, has more Catholics just at that parish than we have in the entire city. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not true. I'm cynical, so I wanted to know what that meant. So I started to do a little research. And actually, I found that the Borna Institute was wrong because the number now is 46.5%. But we'll go with their number just to feel better about ourselves. 50% of our population in the city of Lafayette is Catholic. What did that mean? I went back to the 2000 census. And in 2000, um, in the 2000 census, we had 64.2% of our population was Catholic, right? But this is what was staggering because it backed up what Sherry said. Look at this right here. Nuns, right? The blue line is 2000. The dark line is 2010. Non-affiliated members went up by, from negative from 5.5%. I don't know what that means. I don't know how you have a negative 5% in, in a census study. I mean, I'm sure that there's some political jokes there, but we won't go there. But from 2000 to 2018, nuns went up to 23.5% from negative 5.5%. Okay, so, so let's put that into perspective a little bit. Our population from 2000 and 2017, because this was a 2017 survey, in Lafayette went up 14%. So our population growth was 14% from 2000 to 2017. Our rate of decline of Catholics was negative 18%. So we were losing people from the church faster than we were bringing them into the city. How did we end up here? 
I can make a lot of speculations. I think Kristen mentioned it in her talk. We started sacramentalizing people for years. For, for the last 50 years, we've sacramentalized people. What do I mean by that? Because you haven't worked for the church. So for the last 50 years, we've prepped our, 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 our children to receive a sacrament. We haven't evangelized them. In other words, we haven't introduced them to who Jesus is. We've prepped them to receive a sacrament. And I would argue that we haven't even done that well. And I know that we haven't done that well because I look at confirmation curriculums from other places and I start scratching my head when they're not talking about the Holy Spirit. Like, how do you prep confirmation candidates to receive a sacrament that's all about the Holy Spirit and you're not talking about the Holy Spirit? But what they are talking about is they're talking about Catholicism 101 and they're going back through the history of the papacy and all of this stuff, but they're not talking about that sacrament and the implications of that sacrament. So we've sacramentalized people before we've catechized them and before we've evangelized them. We've prepared them to receive the sacrament. And we're hyper-focused on that. John Paul II says it this way. It is still possible for baptized Catholics to be, quote, still without any explicit personal attachment to Jesus Christ. They only have the capacity to believe placed within them by baptism and the presence of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the sacramental grace is in our life, but we don't know how to unleash it in our life. We've received it, but it's not magic. We have to learn how to cooperate with that grace. And in order to do that, we have to know Jesus, and we have to know that he sent the Holy Spirit to help us to cooperate with that grace. A priest said it this way, our congregations are made up primarily of baptized, uncatechized, unevangelized, unchristian people. Because if we don't know Jesus, then we can't be Christian, right? I don't think we would argue that one. If we don't know Jesus, then we could even be robots who are just going through motions because grandma told us to. Not that that's bad. Don't, don't check out there, right? Because if we're robots going through motions and we're coming to Mass every Sunday and we're, we're doing all the Catholic things that we're supposed to be doing, guess what? We've jumped the biggest hurdle with those people because they are in the door. All we have to do is introduce them to who Jesus is. At the end of the Gospel, Jesus said, go and proclaim the Gospel to every. Go and make disciples of all nations. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, hey, have this Bible study at your parish or offer this really cool event on a Saturday and get a bunch of people to come to it or do this retreat or do this or do that and, and invite people to come. And that is important. We have to go out and proclaim who Jesus is in our own worlds. And we don't do that well as Catholics. We don't like to talk about our religion. So what is discipleship? Is it based off of Sunday Mass attendance? Is it based off of adoration? Is it based off of involvement in the parish? And so I was curious. So as I moved into this new role, I would, we like to boast of numbers. As soon as I got to St. Pius, I was inundated with how many ministries we've had. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you've heard this. I've had the number thrown around that we have 70 plus ministries, right? That we have a little over 3,000 families. That, that means, if you, add it, if, you, if you go out, we have a little over 9,000 members in our parish. And so I was curious to know how many people were involved in all the stuff that we have going on. And, and I could quantify a number, and that number is 3,500. And, and that's based off of estimates, and that is not assuming any duplications, right? So that's assuming that if we have 3,500, quote, people that are involved in the ministries of our parish, that means that what, what I'm qualifying or what I'm quantifying is that each one of those people are unique. We know that that's not true, right? So we know that that number is not accurate. And that number, 3,500, also takes into account every adorer that is in our adoration chapel and every student that is in our school. Okay, so 3,500. In May, the bishop asked us to do a head count at all the masses. So from here on out in May and October every year, we're going to be counting who's coming to mass. We had 
2,800 people that attended Mass on average in the month of May. We have 9,000 parishioners. Do we have a healthy church? I think in some ways, but, but what about all the people that are, that are on our books that we're not missing, that, that, that we're not? And so I, I saw this analogy the way, the way that, that we, we boast numbers in the Catholic, Catholic Church, and we don't just, this is not unique to St. Pius. Please know that I'm not just picking on us. And I think that, that we're ahead of the curve in, in, in many ways. And I think that the city of Lafayette is ahead of the curve in many ways, too. I don't think that the rate of decrime at negative 18%, on average around the country, I've heard it as high as a, a negative 30%. So 30% of Catholics are leaving. We're at negative 18%. That means that we're doing a little bit better than other parts of the country. But the way, the way that, that we, we boast numbers, numbers in our ministry is, is like a gene manufacturer, manufacturer saying this. We used 200 million yards of fabric more last year to make jeans than we did the year before. Well, how many jeans did you sell? I have no idea. You see what I'm saying? So how do we get to a healthy place? What does, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. Pope Benedict says it this way. Being a Christian isn't a lofty idea, but the encounter with a person that gives life a new horizon. But the encounter with a person that gives life a new horizon. We have got to start introducing people to Jesus. And that happens, as Kristen said, in our stories. Because hopefully each one of us can go some to at least one point in our life and say, this is where Jesus became real. I was the kid that grew up in church. My parents drug me to the community of Jesus crucified every weekend. When the catechism of the Catholic Church came out, I was at um, the community of Jesus crucified and Father Fry and Father Champagne were unpacking what it meant. I was in fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade, and I was being drugged there. I knew all the church stuff. It was my, the summer between my eighth grade year and my freshman year that Jesus became a person and not just a good idea. As I interview our confirmation candidates, they can regurgitate all the facts of our faith. And then I ask them who Jesus is, and they really struggle with articulating that. They, they, they give me all the definitions, but they, they struggle with that. The other image that I got um, about, a, about a, what a disciple is was an image. Um, it was in a magazine article that I was reading on discipleship um, by, um, is it Ed Sri? Am I saying that correct? Dr. Ed Sri? Um, did I say that right? Yeah, okay. This is being recorded, so I don't want to butcher anyone's name. I will butcher normal words, but I want to make sure I get name pronunciations correctly. He said that in the time of Jesus, a disciple would follow so close to the rabbi, right? Not just whoever their rabbi, whoever their teacher was, that they would have been covered by the dust that the rabbi was kicking up. Like that's how close they would follow their teacher. That at the time of Jesus, if the disciple's rabbi died and his father died, at the same time, he would be at the bed of his rabbi instead of his father, right? It brings a whole new meaning to let the dead bury their dead, right, when Jesus said that. How closely are we following Jesus, and how do we articulate what that looks like? And so for the past year, we four years ago, started going through this book. We went through it, um, and then last year we... Um, we had a staff retreat and we started kind of playing with the idea of vision statements and mission statements. And I think we're still playing with those ideas, but that launched into our strategic planning. Um, and so in April of last year, we started really trying to pray into what it was God was calling us and what it was that a disciple would look like here at St. Pius and the phases that that individual would go through and how they could identify, you know, where they're at, what step are they in, in this process. And so, and so this, this is what we came up with. And this, this was, was a fight, fight, I want you to know, to, to come, come to, to, it's right, right here. here. I, I saw Bob goes, that's, that's, that's it. it. So, so these banners are about to make a whole lot of sense to you. A few people have said, what's that all about? Lost my train of thought. 
And so this was a fight. I mean, we went from, so we started with forming intentional disciples. We read a couple of other books. We went to the Bishop's document on making missionary disciples. Um, and in the document, Making Missionary Disciples, the bishops talk about four stages. They talk about encounter. They talk about accompaniment. They talk about a community. And they talk about sharing. And those were our statements. And we were looking at a baseball diagram and, and trying to just go through movement and there were arguments and there was pencil throwings and feelings got hurt and sometimes we walked away feeling very infirmed and, and encouraged and then at one meeting we erased the baseball diagram and we started drawing circles and we wrestled with this idea of accompaniment and community and like because we understood from the document with the bishops how they differentiated those two things but they in our minds sounded a lot alike and so we got to this diagram eventually that the typical disciple at St. Pius is going to go through five stages, five phases. Some people are going to start seeking. We've all started seeking. Uh, and, and, and eventually, we're going to get back to a point of seeking, right? Uh, Ms. Mayor said over and over, this is not a process that we go through and we hit sharing and, okay, I'm done. I'm sharing my faith. We're going to go right back through it because the Lord is constantly inviting us into to a deeper relationship and a deeper love with him. But seeking is the first time that we're going through the process. Seeking is where we're wondering, is there more to life than this? Then my daily experience, is there more to life than this? And then the bishops were right on the money encounter, right? There's no mistake that we... In, that we named our monthly worship night encounter. That was done very intentionally. Because Pope Benedict says that when we encounter Jesus, it changes the horizon of our life. Our life takes on a new direction. When I encounter Jesus, I know that there's something that needs to be changed. I know that there is more to life. And his name is Jesus. Experiencing. And so for those of you who have been through Acts, um, you'll notice that the conversation came out while somebody was wearing an axe shirt. Um, experiencing. My life now has new meaning and a new direction. I'm being surrounded by a community of people. I've had this encounter, and I don't, I don't really know what to do now. And so now I'm having this experience of a community that's surrounding me and that is accompanying me on this journey. They're, they're helping me. And they're praying for me, and they're walking with me, and they're being patient as the Lord continues to draw me deeper into him. And then the becoming, right? The becoming is where we really start teaching the faith. It's where we start giving those doctrinal truths and those theological answers. It's where people are going to start asking the question. And you've had this, especially those of you who are in small groups, right? Who are in a small faith community. There comes a point where somebody has had an encounter, and they're, they're, they're being, being surrounded, surrounded by this community, and they're, they're being walked and accompanied through, through it, it, right? And, 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 and I can remember there was a day where the question came out, well, you know, I, I don't know why the church teaches this, because I don't know if I fully believe in it. Like, but I'm wrestling with it because I know the church teaches it, but I don't understand why. Do you know? See, there's a question. Now I can answer a question. See, when we're listening and people are telling us their stories and we have the tendency to want to correct, sometimes they're not asking questions. Ms. Lemaire says it great. We, we have a tendency to, ask, to answer questions that people aren't asking. But in the becoming, they begin to ask, now I know that there are things in my life that I need to change, and I know that there are reasons why the church teaches this, and I want to know, I have a desire to know, because I'm in love with Jesus, and I want to do what Jesus wants me to do, and I know that he gave me the church to show me how to do that, and to teach me how to be who I am. And in that becoming, as we're growing, as we're learning, eventually we have to hit a point where we're living out of our baptism. Because the mission of the church was given to us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We have to share our faith. It's not an option. It's a command. It's a commission. It's an invitation into mission. And you and I were baptized into that mission. Now, the way that we share it is going to be unique to all of us. You may not ever get on a microphone to give a talk because that might not be your charism. Kristen said, you might not be the one knocking on somebody's door. Maybe you share your faith through the gift of intercessory prayer. Because right? each one of us 
has been equipped uniquely to be in this mission. And so those are our phases. Sherry says this, our job is to reach out and deliberately and intentionally help people find the pearl of great price. His name is Jesus. Deliberately and intentionally. And intentional. I'm going to get to why I love those in just a second. If life at the parish level changes, then the life of the whole church changes. If we're deliberate and intentional here at St. Pius, if we intentionally move close to people who are walking through the doors of our church, if we intentionally move close to people who are not in our church and invite them to come to something in our church, and then we accompany them, and we walk with them, and we show them who Jesus is, then St. Pius starts to change. Imagine, go back to what Kristen talked about earlier this morning, the, that Catholic identity. Imagine if we were all living from a Catholic identity. Imagine if we all made decisions based on, does this matter to Jesus? And if it doesn't, then I'm not doing it. Imagine the life that you and I would have. Imagine the life that our parish would have. Imagine how contagious that would be to other people. They, it wouldn't be, I'm just doing this because I do it. How many times have you been asked, why are you Catholic? Well, because I am. But if we're living out of our baptism, if we're living out of our relationship with the Lord, then we come alive and the people around us come alive. But it's deliberate and it's intentional, and if we change life here, then we will change life everywhere else in the church and everywhere else in the world. So does, does that look like normal structures to us? Right now, this is how our parish is organized. We have our parish office, we have our commissions, and then we have a whole bunch of ministries listed underneath each one of those commissions. And if you're not familiar with this language, go and see Dax. He'll explain it to you later. Dax joined the parish council and he asked me, well, what's the commission's thing? I'm in charge of one. I was like, it'll be okay. And this isn't necessarily a bad structure, but I asked somebody once, if somebody walks up to St. Pius and says, where do I start? Here's our structure. What do you tell them? Have you asked the question, where do I start at St. Pius? Like, what is it that I should be involved in? And then you looked at the list of things that are going on. Maybe, maybe you filled out our, our parish census form, and there's a whole bunch of checkboxes of what do you want to be involved in? And you're like, I don't even know what half these things are, right? Where do I start? It's very confusing. Jesus said that we should become fishers of men. And I just love this image because I think that this is how we've treated church forever. We have a whole bunch of stuff going on because we feel like the more we offer, the better because we're going to bound to offer something for somebody. And we're all on the same bridge, fishing in the same little hole. And our, I don't, it's a miracle that our, well, maybe they have gotten tangled, right? I need to sync my phone up like Kristen to where I don't have to keep walking back and forth. So we also read this book called Simple Church. Imagine a church where you can articulate clearly how someone moves from being a new Christian to a mature follower of Christ. Imagine that your church is no longer just busy, but is alive with ministries and activities that make a difference. And so we looked back at our structures and we thought, busy. And really everything funnels through the parish office. That makes us busy, right? And then we looked at our phases and said, well, what would that look like here at St. Pius? And so that we began to align everything to a clear path to be able to explain to people how you move through the phases of discipleship here at St. Pius. So let me take the colors off just to where you can see it a little better. So we can go from seeking to encountering because these can go hand in glove. They should go hand in glove because this is the entry point of our parish. And what are the things that we do that cater to people who are seeking? And how do we bring them in intentionally into our church and then surround them with people to walk with them through this whole process? Now, we haven't figured out all the details of everything yet. 
right? But what we do know is we do want to make small groups a priority in our parish. Because when the church walks with the church, no one feels alone. And some of you who have heard my witness know that I have a friend um, who, who was a Catholic national speaker who left the church when his daughter died because he didn't feel like the church walked with him. And if you haven't heard that story, I'll give you just this much information. There's no way that Father Brady and Father Joel can walk with every single person, especially if we have 9,000 plus people, 3,000 plus families here at our church. And even with the size staff, there's still no way that we can do it. But if we intentionally move people into small groups, guess what happens? When life happens, no one feels alone because the church is walking with them. And when Father needs to know, somebody knows how to get in touch with Father. Right? And so we walk with people. And we provide formative experiences for them. And we do that well here. We have Bible studies and we have you know, our TMIY, and we have all kinds of stuff that we do that can be formative for the people of God, right? For the church, for those who are, who are hungering for more knowledge. And then what if we helped people discern their charisms, right? Sherry says it this way. Each of us, no, I'm sorry, back up. She says it this way. There is someone in the world right now that is waiting for you to give what you've been given to give. And their salvation depends on it. In other words, you have a gift that God has uniquely given to you. And you have a mission that God has uniquely invited your life into. And there is somebody that he has created that needs you to get them to heaven. Because of the gift, the charism that God has given you. What if you don't share that? Because what if you don't know what it is? Right? So what if as a church, in this accompaniment, in this walking with people, in this helping to form people, what if we help people to discern what their charisms are before we send them out to share? Right? I joke about it, and Blake will laugh, because we do this often. Somebody walks up, they knock on the church door. Hey, I came back to Mass for the first time in 35 years, and I want to get involved. Where can I start? We got a fifth grade position open in our PSR program. Here's a book. Good luck. Right? <laughs> you laugh because you've probably been invited to do that. And then what we quickly figure out is they don't like kids and they don't have a charism for teaching. So the kids are miserable. They're not learning anything. And the ministry leader's out the door in six weeks. Right? But what if we started to find people who had a charism for teaching and they loved kids? Well, then our faith becomes alive, right? And what if you lived out of your charisms and served out of your charisms before we send you out to share in the unique way that God has given you to share? Well, St. Catherine Tiana says it this way. If you are what you should be, you will set the world on fire. And that's what we want here at St. Pius. We want each of us to be who we are. We want us to be able to recognize the moments in our life where we're seeking. Because each one of us is going to come back to this moment where we're seeking. Maybe some of us are seeking right now. Maybe there's somebody in this room that's wondering, you know what, this has been a great day because it's touching on, I think there might be something more to life, right? And for others, maybe, maybe we've been sharing for a while and we're wondering, what else does God have for me? So we're seeking, right? Because if we can identify we, we're seeking and that's where we're at, that's the phase, guess what we know? Then the next step is encounter. And if I'm having an encounter with God, and he's drawing me deeper into who he is, then guess what I know? When I can identify that that's where I'm at, then the next step is experience. And if I feel like people are accompanying me at this particular season in my life, that they're walking with me and they're journeying with me and they're praying with me, then my next step is becoming. And if I feel like I'm learning in my faith and I'm growing in my faith, and, and if I'm being honest, this is where I feel we, 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 we did a little discipleship check-in yesterday. 
I feel like as I pick up this book, the five promises of baptism and just where I'm at right now and and how I'm growing in my faith and growing in my desire to know more about my faith and growing in my desire. Like I'm starting to recognize that I really believe that the particular phase that I am in right now is becoming. And guess what? I know that my next step is God's about to start asking me to share. Right? And if I'm sharing a lot, and I find myself sharing a lot and, and, and telling people about what the Lord is doing in my life and inviting people, then guess what? I'm about to start seeking again that deeper encounter. Becoming a disciple is a process. Where are you in it? That's what this is all about. Where are you in that process? Think about Peter, and we'll wrap up with that image. In Luke 5... He meets meets the Lord Lord for the first time. He has has an encounter encounter with the Lord that changes his life. And in that encounter, he makes a decision. It says that they left everything to follow him. You see, when we make a decision to be a disciple, Kristen said, I think, I don't know if she said it today. I know she said it yesterday. Turning toward Jesus means that I'm turning away from something else, right? If it means nothing with my life in Christ, then it means nothing, period. When Peter made that decision that day on that seashore to walk away from everything, he didn't fully know who Jesus was yet. It was Matthew 16 before he professed him, well, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. His journey with the Lord wasn't perfect. You know, sometimes we backtrack through the phases because we're human. When he made that decision that day, he didn't know that he was going to be a pope because he didn't even know what a pope was because he didn't know Jesus was going to found a church to help us know him, to help us know him. He didn't know he was going to be a saint because he didn't know what a saint was because Remember, they didn't have hope to get into heaven. The gate had been locked. The keep out sign had been put up. But that day, there was something about Jesus that drew in his heart that made him want more of Jesus, of who Jesus is. So the invitation for you and I is to constantly be discerning where we're at in the phase, in the process of discipleship so that we can continue to move Because the Lord is continuing to invite us deeper into who he is. Praise. Let's see. Beautiful.